What's up everybody? Rocky from the Couch Thoughts Podcast here. I'm going to start a new series on the channel called The EU Review, where I go through in release order and review the Star Wars Legends and uh, Expanded Universe material book by book. And before I do that, I wanted to give a shout out to the YouTube creator who um, inspired me to do this, and that would be Star Wars Explained. And if you don't know who Star Wars Explained is, I don't know how you found this video, but link in the description to Star Wars Explained channel. Go watch all of his stuff. Great YouTube uh, channel. But I just wanted to give, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars Explained, and I wanted to give him credit for this video, and I'm awaiting the rest of his EU material. He already has his review to Splinter of the Mind's Eye out for a while now. He hasn't had a chance to get to the rest of them, but in the meantime, uh, please accept this uh, poor imitation. Thanks. Written in 1978, Splinter of the Mind's Eye by Alan Dean Foster would become the first entry in what would become the Star Wars Expanded Universe, or Legends, after the Disney acquisition. What makes this book unique, however, is that it was released before the second theatrically released movie in the Star Wars franchise, The Empire Strikes Back. And after reading the book, I have to say, you really have to wonder how much inspiration George Lucas would take from this book for the subsequent films. This is readily apparent in the introduction that was written by the man himself. Lucas states, It hit bookstores just as I was preparing to write my own further adventure of Luke in the form of a script entitled The Empire Strikes Back. Now that's not to say there aren't some pretty wacky things in this that would look ridiculous in the eyes of a modern Star Wars fan, but being that it's the first book in the EU and it was written before the original trilogy was even finished, that can kind of be expected. So let's see how this book pans out and see how it would go on to shape the rest of the books in the EU to come. So let's go ahead and get into the story of the Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and uh, just a warning, spoilers ahead. So the story of Splinter of the Mind's Eye is fairly straightforward, it doesn't really take a lot of twists and turns, but Foster's writing style throughout is good enough to keep the reader engaged, especially given this is a fairly short book. The version I have is 297 pages, which if you compare to something today like uh, you know Game of Thrones, it's really not that long. Our story starts with Luke and Leia on a mission to gather rebel support from a planet called Sarkarpus. I think that's how it's pronounced at least. But their trip is cut short when they crash land on a jungle planet called Mimban. R2 and 3PO are also along for the ride. But, let's see. Crash landing on a dense jungle planet. Does that remind me of anything? Anyway, I was kind of expecting a much longer passage uh, in the book of being lost in the jungle. But Luke finds Leia fairly quickly and they begin to look for civilization and find a little mining town. After gaining some disguises, they take refuge in a bar and attempt to hide their identity, but an old woman named Hala approaches them and sees right through Luke's disguise. And it's because she's kind of Force-sensitive, and Luke is basically a big Force beacon. Um, but it's funny how basically Hala is just Maz Kanata in 1978, so I'd like to see what kind of inspiration J.J. took in that character, because it's seriously scary how close their characters really are. She then shows them a splinter of a jewel known as a Kyber Crystal. Now, anyone who's read an EU book or watched the Clone Wars animated series knows what a kyber crystal is. It's the crystal that powers a lightsaber and also powered the main weapon on the Death Star. It's pretty cool that something like that carried over from a book in 1978. So Hala offers to help them get off the planet if they help her find the rest of the kyber crystal. Luke and Leia then proceed to get into a little quarrel outside the bar and get into a fight with some miners. They're quickly captured by the Empire and taken captive by Captain Supervisor Grammel, who takes the shard and their weapons. Grammel's a good enough villain for the story. He's just menacing enough and not too tough to where our characters can't outsmart him. I liked his character throughout, and like any good agent of the Empire, or really Jedi for that matter, his hubris was his downfall. Luke and Leia are in prison with two hairy creatures, kind of similar to Wookiees called Yuzim. Their names are Hen and Key. So of course Hollow rescues them, and they set out for the temple. During this trek to the temple, however, they encounter a giant worm-like creature called a Wandrella. Hmm, giant worm creature. Where have I heard that before? Luke and Leia get separated from the group again and end up hiding in some caves which contain a local species called Kawe. The Kawe have the others held prisoner, and Luke has to fight a Kawe warrior in single combat to gain their freedom. Luke then senses Vader and the Empire approaching, and they have to team up with the Kawe to fight them. So let's see. Species of lesser intelligence take some of our heroes hostage, and they have to band together with their captors to defeat the Empire. Hmm. Teddy bears. <laughs> 
After this, the crew heads to the Kyber Crystal Temple and finds the titular Mind's Eye. They have to fight another monster, which Luke defeats by cutting down some pillars, but he's pinned in the process. Then Vader shows up, and to my surprise, Leia actually fights Vader with Luke's saber. Uh, she even has a little bit of success by cutting his mask, but in the end, she's defeated. Luke is freed by Hen and tries to fight Vader, but he's too wounded. But then Hala places the crystal in Luke's hand, and he is miraculously healed. He defeats Vader, even chopping off his arm in the process. And clearly, that didn't make it into The Empire Strikes Back. This healing power of the Kyber Crystal obviously doesn't fit in later canon, but hey, maybe that's how Plagueis the Wise cheated death? Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? There are a few weird things that happen with Luke's saber in this book that doesn't really match up with later canon. For example, when Luke and Leia attempt to break into a store to steal some mining clothes, Luke turns down the power of his saber and makes a lockpick out of a thin energy beam. Also, later he has to recharge the saber from a blaster. I think these are actually pretty cool ideas that add some variety to this story, but I'm glad this didn't make it into later canon. The lightsaber is already OP enough, and to be a lockpick too, I'm not sure. Plus, you could just go all Qui-Gon Jinn on that bitch and melt the whole door. The Luke and Leia love story is another sticking point for me here. Obviously, Foster had no way of knowing they were brother and sister because I don't think even George Lucas himself knew that at the time, especially for that scene in Empire. But looking back now, it seems out of place. They get a little too close at times. A couple of other interesting things here. Leia has PTSD from the Vader torture in the first movie and the subsequent explosion of Alderaan. This adds a very interesting layer to the character that wasn't really explored in the official canon until the Bloodlines novel. It's also neat that the kyber crystal was red. In later canon, the crystals were mostly blue, green, and yellow. The only way a crystal could become red is for a Sith to bleed it with the blood of his enemies. Or the blood of his friends, for that matter. Could that mean this particular crystal was some sort of Sith relic? Obviously not given the time frame and when the book was written, but I like to think that's the reason. Finally, Darth Vader knew the codes that would shut down 3PO. It's really cool that this happens to fit with the prequel canon that Anakin built the droid years earlier. This is just a big coincidence, but it's fun to look at through a modern lens. Overall, given the year it was written, I can't really complain too much about the story contained within Splinter of the Mind's Eye. It's a fun, short read, and I would recommend it to anybody who would be watching this video. As I said, I like to go back and experience these books through the eyes of someone who's lived long enough to experience the Disney canon, and you can take that for better or for worse. This one's especially interesting because you can really see the inspiration it had on future stories. So, I'm not going to give a number review on these, but suffice to say, go out and read it. I enjoyed it. And I really encourage everyone to read along with me as I go through these. The next one in release order will be Han Solo at Star's End. So guys, thanks for watching this video, and until the next one, later.